Hey everyone, Alicia Zari here, and today we're going to talk about trauma-informed teaching. This summer I read the book Teaching to Strengths, and it was jam-packed with information that not only is relevant for any school year, but more importantly, this unusual start of the year. So let's dive in. What we're going to do today is unpack each chapter of the trauma-informed teaching practices highlighted in Teaching to Strengths, Supporting Students Living with Trauma, Violence, and Chronic Stress. So as you can see, I took all the concepts from this book, took chapter summaries, and really unpacked each part into sketch notes. So while you're seeing it at a, at a glance right now, let's dive on in. So today we're going to talk about the why, the what, and eventually the how. First, let's start with why. When I first picked up this book, this was actually pre-pandemic, um, and it said in a 2012 national survey that 50% of students are, have experienced or are experiencing trauma, violence, and chronic stress. Well, my assumption is since March, that number is not 50% anymore. It's 100%. All of us are experiencing trauma, possibly violence, and chronic stress during these unusual times. But instead of feeling defeated and helpless and hopeless, um, we're going to use this, um, these principles of teaching to strengths um, to be a lighthouse of hope, keeping high expectations for ourselves and our students and recognizing that we all start somewhere. The things that are the foundation of teaching to strengths um, really looks at evidence-based tenets of teaching, of strengths-based teaching, understanding culture, and learning through social interactions. And this comes from a place from positive psychology, positive youth development, and also the work of Carol Dweck and others around growth mindset. The theory behind this is that cognition paired with social interaction is what leads to learning. And we understand that culture, starting from the local or child, parents, family, all the way up to the community at large, influence how we learn and interact. So what is strengths-based teaching? Typically, we are used to having a deficit lens. We look at the glass half empty. We label kids as they can't do this, or they're not meeting the standard, or they are below grade level. And a strengths-based approach looks not at all the things that they can't do, but at the things they can do, what they do bring with them to the classroom. And it's going to be um, dipping into the universal design for learning and understanding that each of us has a jagged learning profile. We have strengths, we have weaknesses, but it is not consistent and it can't be easily, um, easily stereotyped because we are unique individuals. One size does not fit all. So a formula for a strengths-based approach is to look at our own self first, really taking a deep dive into some self-reflection. What are my values as a teacher? What are my strengths? What are my biases that I might bring based on my own experience or my own view of the world, added with intentional practice of teaching and identifying strengths. We understand that all students can do this, but it has to be modeled and explicitly taught. And so pairing your own understanding plus intentional teaching creates an infused strengths-based approach. So really the meat of it. So how do we do this? First, we prepare to work with diverse learners. During these first few weeks of school, that means interviews. That means getting to know students and their families. Who are they? Um, one of my favorites is the, the prompt, what I wish my teacher knew about me, and having students share what I wish my um, teacher knew about my child, having parents share, letting them share, rather than just a quick survey or fill in the bubbles, but let them share. Sometimes I've learned more things just by simply asking and truly listening. Next, during these first few weeks of teaching, really pay attention. It's a little bit different in distance learning with the 
experiences being a little bit more isolated, not be able to read body language the same way. But when you do notice a student doing something great, wow, did you notice how you last week were too shy to participate, but now this week you were talking in your breakout group? I did? Pay attention, identify the strengths and wins and celebrate them in order for students to be able to identify who they are and who they, um, what they bring to the classroom. Next, creating a strengths-based learning environment. So once you get to know your students, it's now about creating a classroom culture or learning environment to support a strengths-based approach. It starts with voice and choice. Are your students simply complying or answering the questions with the answers they think you want to hear? Or are they allowed to show some of themselves? Are they allowed to um, share their unique strengths and interests and apply them to the standards and the learning goals for your grade level? Are students able to see themselves in the types of books and types of experiences that you have them, the projects that you um, have students do? During this strengths-based approach or intention at the beginning of the school year, it is more important than ever to create predictable routines. Our world is not um, falling under predictable circumstances. And so anything we can have to lay out, this is what we do when we do school. This is what you can expect when you get onto Zoom or Google Meets. This is how um, I expect you to interact. This is how you um, set up a quiet workspace so that you can independently learn. Here's how to ask for help. All of these predictable routines are so important to students and because they are not the same as the ones we always do in school, it's important that you reestablish those procedures and routines and model and expect it until you get what your desired outcome is. The investment now pays off later. And then just remembering good learning theory. We all have been zombies or zombies after a long day of learning and know that just simply, simply replicating um, an in-person instruction to a digital instruction is not the answer. And so think about this idea of chunk and chew, giving a little bit of time, a chunk of information, and then some chew time, some time to process the information, time for breaks, especially movement breaks. We would never expect kids to sit for this many hours in front of a screen, but now because it's called school, we sometimes might forget those things that we know it to be true, such as participation, movement, collaboration, but that we have to intentionally embed them into our online instruction for this time. Next, scaffolding student-to-student -student relationships. In person, I didn't realize how important it was for students to get to know each other's names until I had a, a parent at, at conferences midway through the year tell me, I think my son's having a hard time this year because he doesn't know his classmates' names. And it was news to me because I thought, we have our names all over. I use the students' names all the time. But that doesn't mean that I had intentionally fostered student-to-student -student relationships. So, some information around that. First, we have to set students up for success with cooperative learning. And yes, I see there's a typo there, cooperative learning. Um, that means that the tasks that we do are not simply in isolation, but ones that they're going to do with, with partners, um, with students that are in the classroom. Um, one tip on that is slowly build up those partnerships. Um, when I first started teaching, I thought the more pairings, the better. And then I went to um, a teacher training and they had me pick all my partners the clock partners or things like that. And I was overwhelmed because now when they asked me to do something like improv or something that was really out of my comfort zone, I wasn't with the partner that I would already build a connection and trust with. I was with someone new. And now I didn't really feel um, in that space to be vulnerable. So think about how your students might be feeling. They may already know their classmates. They may never have met them nor have the chance to interact with them any other time than those few whole class minutes that you have during um, your live instruction. So think about how you might have students partner up 
um, create uh, pairs or trios or groups, small groups that they can get to know for at least a week and have them build trust, get to know each other, embed the get to know you activities in there to build relationships and then ask them to try a task together, try some productive struggle together. As a um, idea for cooperative learning, one thing to consider is all the stuff you're doing pre, before ever assigning a cooperative learning task, you're probably assigning specific partners. You're assigning clear roles, um, just like you would do in the classroom. Maybe your roles in digital space for trios might be reader, reporter, responder. Each student has a specific task, so they know what they are supposed to contribute, what their expectations are. Then you assign an engaging task, something that's purposeful um, work. You model examples and practice roles of what, what does this look like to work as a team? What do we not like when we work in a team? Embed those in your first weeks of instruction. Next, students engage in the task while you um, give them opportunities to reflect, revise, um, and give little tips. And then at the end, you always reflect, how did it go? Even in the most simple tasks, um, I used to do glows and groves. Not just how you did, we went to go see our kindergarten buddies as fourth grade um, students. Go meet our kindergarten buddies. How did it go? Glows and grows. What went well? My buddy said hi to me. Grow. Um, I didn't know how to um, say hello to them when they turned their body away from me. And so we, we would model and model how to respond to problems and solve them together. Create a space for reflection. Lastly, on this slide, I want to talk about the positive timeout. Typically, we think of timeout as something negative, as something that is punitive. But think of timeout in the context of basketball. I coach high school basketball. And when you take a timeout in basketball, it's not always because your team did something wrong. Sometimes it's just to regroup, to reconnect, and to redirect in a, in a way that allows everybody to thrive. So think about this positive timeout as a way for you to say, hey, I'm noticing class that this isn't working for us. What can we do to make this better tomorrow? It's easy to see that academics have to happen and um, addressing unfinished learning, trying to catch up. But in a strengths-based approach, we're not trying to catch up or redo Three, three months of lost learning. There's actually been a lot of fantastic learning that has happened in the past few months. Um, and we're just gonna take this and roll with it and build intention around everything. Last but not least, we're gonna talk about fostering family and guardian engagement. It used to be that family is just are just stakeholders, someone that we take opinion with. Now they're almost like your coworkers. They're the people that are your assistants, helping support and, um, and build up the students in your classroom, their child. And we understand that depending on background, there's gonna be inequities on who has support on a regular basis. And that's gonna be something that you consider in your planning process with your population as you get to know your students on an indi individual basis. But in general, think about what you know about your students. Are you in this kind of first stage white belt novice um, is really just unaware that maybe, maybe everything I think about those students is just preconceived beliefs. Or maybe as I start to get to know my students and their families, I might recognize that I had it wrong, that I might not have understood or I might have generalized a little too quickly. Up to the point, kind of this black belt approach where you understand that each person in each culture has their own um, strength and contribution, and you might be confidently teaching others in that process. So wrapping up, Teaching the Strengths by Debbie Gutzikarian. We are looking at the start of the school year. There is a lot to do. There's a lot to feel like we might need to catch up. But when you create a strengths-based approach, you are not only supporting students with trauma and yourself with trauma, but you're setting a foundation for your school year. 
And that's what's more important than anything, connection over content right now. Connection over content. That's it for me. I'll see you next time.